Jim Turk, and I'd like to welcome you to the today's uh, session, which is will be discussing does cabinet secrecy unduly undermine open government and the public's right to know. I want to begin by acknowledging that the Center for Free Expression is located in the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. I also want to thank the co-sponsors for today's uh, discussion, which are the Edmonton Public Library, the Toronto Public Library, the Milton Public Library, the Thunder Bay Public Library, and the Vancouver Public Library. Access to information is terribly important in any democratic society. Uh, in, insofar as the public discourse, which is the heart of democracy, is informed by the public's right to know and the transparency of governments. But there are a number of exclusions and exceptions to what can be shared with the public. And one of the most challenging and controversial in many cases is an item called cabinet secrecy or cabinet confidences, uh, which grows out of the notion that our uh, cabinets that govern need to have the ability to con to have brainstorming, to share views and so on uh, without being monitored or so on, or otherwise people aren't willing to share ideas that they haven't been tested, uh, to try new directions that may prove not to be smart. Uh, in other words, to have a free-flowing discussion amongst colleagues before making a decision. On the other hand, the provision for cabinet secrecy has been extended by some governments to such a broad way as to effectively deny the public right uh, to information that is important uh, in order for the public to be informed and to uh, be able to uh, operate in, a, uh, in an informed and democratic way. Fortunately, uh, one of our, uh, our, our guests today uh, is Jan Campagnola, who has written a book uh, published late last year entitled Behind Closed Doors, The Law and Politics of Cabinet Secrecy, uh, which goes into this uh, issue in a very thoughtful way. And although it's been about six months, Jan, since uh, your book was published, almost six months, maybe five months, uh, we're treating today's uh, event as one of the several book launches for your book. And we'd encourage people uh, to get it uh, and uh, uh, read it. It's a very thoughtful uh, discussion of, of the many issues related to the law and politics of cabinet secrecy. So welcome, Jan. Jan is an associate professor of law at the University of Ottawa. He previously clerked for the Supreme Court of Canada. He has, served counsel, he has served as counsel to the Privy Council Office. Jan has a master's degree in public, public international law from the University of Cambridge and a doctorate in constitutional law from the University of Toronto. Uh, Behind Closed Doors uh, was featured uh, in the Hill Times as one of the 100 best books for 2021. So again, welcome, Jan. Uh, we're delighted you could be with us today. Thank you so much, Jim. Jan is going to be in conversation with Mel Cap. For those of you who don't Mel, know Mel Cap, I'm really pleased and honored to introduce him. He's one of the most significant and important civil servants in many decades of recent Canadian history. Mel was clerk of the Privy Council, secretary to cabinet, and head of the public service. He also had served as deputy minister in several economic and social departments in the government of Canada. He has served as president of the Institute for Research on Public Policy. He was high commissioner for Canada to the United Kingdom. And he's now distinguished fellow and previously professor in the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. Welcome, Mel. Pleasure. The format for today's conversation between uh, Jan and Mel is one that they will discuss a variety of issues over the next 45 minutes or so, and then we'll bring the audience into the conversation. Um, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there's a, uh, a Q&A button. So as 
uh, Jan and Mel are having their conversation. If there are questions you would like to ask them when we come to the audience part of the program, uh, please jot down your question as you think of it. You don't have to wait till we turn to the audience. Just uh, write your question down. And Ange Holmes, who's the coordinator of the center, will be monitoring the questions. And when we get to the audience part of it, Mel will turn to Ange and ask Ange for the first question from the audience. Um, so we hope you have some interesting and challenging questions. Uh, this is a dynamic duo to ask them to, and I think it'll be uh, a really uh, wonderful opportunity to explore this very serious and important question with regard to the public's right to know and public access to information. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the two of you. Thanks very much, Jim. Um, and thanks to the Center for Free Expression. Um, I, Jan and I were joking the other day, and I said that uh, this is a very important issue, but there's only about five people in Canada who care about it, and he and I are two of them. Uh, in fact, it's an issue of much bigger import uh, than that. And in, in fact, um, there are several hundred members of parliament, former members of parliament, members of provincial legislatures and former members of provincial legislatures, all of whom actually have staked a lot of uh, interest in this because they've spoken candidly in cabinet. Uh, and the public at large has an interest in good government. And as a result, there's an interest in cabinet confidence. At essence, there's a tension, a tension between open government and transparency which is required for accountability in a democracy, and the quality and processes of governing that require candor and openness in cabinet for the optimality of decision-making. And Jim talked a bit about that. Let me tell you, in 1993, uh, Prime Minister Campbell changed the oath of office to turn it into a, um, a plain language statement of the commitment of ministers. And when I was clerk in 2000, we actually restored a phrase that had been dropped, inadvertently dropped. And the phrase was, quote, I will in all things to be treated, debated, and resolved in the Privy Council, faithfully, honestly, and truly declare my mind and my opinion. I shall keep secret all matters committed and revealed to me in this capacity, or that should be secretly treated of in Council. And that was a recognition that effective government required uh, candor and openness if cabinet is to be effective. And a lack of secrecy impacts the, the effectiveness of governing. One of the first things I did as clerk in 1999, low these many years ago, um, was deal with the 20 year rule. And that meant that when Joe Clark, who still is active in public life, uh, was prime minister in 1979, his minutes of cabinet meetings were up for review and, and release. And I had to decide if national security required keeping cabinet minutes as confidences further than the 20 year rule. At that time in 1999, Joe Clark was then the leader of the opposition. 20 years is great if the political life of a politician is only 15 years. But Chrétien lasted 40 years, and his contributions to the Pearson cabinet discussions were disclosed well before he was even prime minister. Is this correct? What's the harm that comes from this? The danger is and the harm is that there can become a chill on candor in cabinet. Consider the Liberal and NDP Confidence and Supply Agreement, uh, which was signed uh, by Jagmeet Singh and Prime Minister Trudeau just uh, a couple of weeks ago. It obliges public servants to brief members of the fourth party, but they still have an obligation to keep cabinet confidences. How can they brief the fourth party without briefing the loyal opposition? And how can they brief the NDP without disclosing cabinet confidences prior to the tabling of legislation or the budget. Those are the two elements that are specified uh, in that agreement. Premier Ford has just appealed yesterday or in the last couple of days, uh, a decision of the Ontario Court of Appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada regarding his mandate letters to his ministers. 
So if this is the Center for Free Expression, I will exercise that freedom and critique Jim Turk, the director of the center, for Jim, your comments this morning on the radio, where you were saying that this was unnecessary and that free expression required access to those letters. And I'll only make the point that um, if the mandate letters are going to be made public, they will be useless as a strategic instrument of governing. They will be merely the reiteration of the platform uh, commitments. And that's exactly what we've seen at the federal level. Justin Trudeau released uh, all of his mandate letters. And if you look at them and look at the Minister of Finance's mandate letter, it goes on for pages and pages and it looks like the platform. And what's the priority for the Minister of Finance? I have no idea. Whereas in the past, and I've helped write those letters, the prime minister would have said in the mandate letter, you've got all of the platform to worry about, but here are the three things I want you to pay attention to. So just before I turn it over to uh, Professor Campagnolo and I'll ask a couple of uh, questions, let me merely note the value and importance of this book. And I know that it may or may not be uh, visible, uh, but behind closed doors, the law and politics of cabinet secrecy is a scholarly exploration of a subject that really has had very little academic review. And I think what's important here is to uh, have a dispassionate reflection on what's necessary in the law and what could be improved in the law. And that's what this book does. And so for that, I congratulate Jan. Now to the uh, event, let's uh, hear from Jan. So Jan, why don't you tell us what got you started and interested in this uh, particular issue and, and sort of, you know, how did your thinking evolve through the process of uh, doing your research? Thank you very much, Mel, for your very kind words about the book. I must say that I, I'm honored to have this opportunity to discuss cabinet secrecy with you. And I am grateful to Jim and the Center for Free Expression for organizing this event. I'm joining you today from Ottawa, uh, the traditional land of the Algonquin people. So to answer your, your first question, uh, I came up with the idea for this book when I was working at the Privy Council office. As counsel for PCO, I, I often had to handle requests for access to cabinet documents in the context of litigation, commissions of inquiry, parliamentary proceedings, and the Access to Information Act. And that's how, you know, as a young lawyer, I came to learn about the, the many privileges and immunities governing access to state secrets. Because of my interest in politics and public law, I was especially drawn to cabinet secrecy. But I quickly realized, as you pointed out, that no books and very few articles were available on the topic. And so I started researching and reading primary sources, and I then had the idea of putting together a course on cabinet secrecy for my colleagues. Uh, I wanted to, to demystify the concept to make it more accessible. And after teaching the course uh, several times, I decided to put my thoughts on paper. But I wanted my writing to be the result of independent research and thinking, my goal wasn't simply to present the orthodox position on cabinet secrecy, but also to analyze it in a critical manner. And that's why I decided to pursue this project as part of the doctoral program at the University of Toronto. And as I started reading more broadly about the rule of law and the separation of powers, my thinking evolved. I remained convinced that cabinet secrecy was essential to the proper functioning of our system of responsible government, but I realized that the current statutory framework had significant flaws. So, Jan, before we get to the flaws, and, and you and I agree on some of them and disagree on others, but uh, we'll come to that. Could you summarize in a sentence or two what you think the essence of those principles of Westminster parliamentary democracy are that have to be preserved? Well, I'll do my best. I, I, 
I don't know if I can do it in a sentence or two, but I'll, I'll do it quickly. So, you know, it's important to start with the foundation. To understand the importance of cabinet secrecy, we must understand how the system of responsible government works, especially the confidence and the solidarity conventions. So as you know, under the confidence convention, ministers must maintain the support of the House of Commons in order to remain in power. And under the solidarity convention, ministers are collectively responsible for government decisions, meaning that they stand or fall as a group. But for these conventions to work as intended, ministers need a forum to propose debate and decide government policy in action. That forum is cabinet. And cabinet meetings take place in private so that ministers can speak freely on proposed policies, reconcile any difference of opinion they may have, and reach a consensus on what to do. And cabinet secrecy also increases the, the efficiency of the decision-making process by protecting ministers from undue external pressure and interference. So because of cabinet secrecy, when a decision is made and announced, all ministers can publicly support that decision, knowing that any disagreement between them will remain private and won't be exploited by their political opponents. So in short, you know, without cabinet secrecy, ministers wouldn't be able to remain united in public and wouldn't be able to maintain the confidence of the house. And as a result, the system of responsible government would be dysfunctional. So I, I get that and I've seen that in action, um, but let me probe you and push you just a bit. If you think that um, you need some secrecy, you clearly don't need all secrecy. I remember uh, when I was a junior official, uh, uh, a Privy Council uh, office uh, staffer once told me, look, if the Toronto Star is put on the cabinet table, it does not make it a cabinet secret. So there are still questions of scope and, and duration. Um, but what would happen in your mind if cabinet meetings had to take place in public and cabinet documents had to be made public immediately? Well, my answer to this question is very straightforward. You know, if cabinet meetings had to take place in public, the real discussion between ministers would likely move to another forum. And if cabinet documents had to be made public immediately, these documents would likely cease to be created. Let me give you two examples. Uh, the first is about open cabinet meetings. In 2001, BC Premier Gordon Campbell decided to open one cabinet meeting per month to the public with a live broadcast and online posting of the relevant cabinet documents. But these meetings did not contain any debate, conflict, or discord between ministers. In fact, you know, open cabinet meetings are simply PR stunts. They're not like closed cabinet meetings. Ministers can't afford to argue with each other in public. And that's why the, the real discussion always takes place behind closed doors. Now, the second example is about government transitions. Since uh, 1957, when power changes hands, the incoming government cannot gain access to the cabinet documents of the outgoing government. This rule, known as the Access Convention, was developed after the Cabinet Secretariat was created. So without this rule, you know, the Cabinet documents of one political party could fall into the hands of its political opponents. To prevent this unacceptable outcome, uh, Cabinet documents would be removed, destroyed, or would cease to be created. And this would harm our institutional memory and archives. It's interesting. I, when I was clerk, um, I ended up having to deal quite extensively with Brian Mulroney, who was the previous prime minister, twice removed, and Kim Campbell, um, where there were court proceedings that required access to their uh, documents. And they were there privileges that were being dealt with, and therefore I couldn't release them without their acknowledgement or agreement. Um, 
in what circumstances do you think it is appropriate for ministers or prime ministers or premiers to release uh, their cabinet confidences? And is there a difficulty if we give them discretion that they'll use it as those PR stunts that you were describing? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's important to stress that as a matter of constitutional conventions, uh, cabinet secrecy is not intended to last forever. At the federal level in Canada, uh, cabinet confidences, because of various statutes that have been adopted, are protected for 20 years. But, you know, as a matter of convention, they can be disclosed earlier in some circumstances. For example, uh, former ministers can reveal cabinet confidences when they resign because of a disagreement with their colleagues to explain why they had to resign. And former ministers can also reveal cabinet confidences when they publish their political memoirs to share their experience with civil society. In addition, you know, on some occasions, the government has voluntarily agreed to lift the veil of secrecy in the public interest. One example of uh, this type of situation would be commissions of inquiry like the McDonald inquiry on the RCMP security service, the Gomery inquiry on the sponsorship scandal, and uh, the Oliphant inquiry on former Prime Minister Brian Maroney. Also, uh, the veil of secrecy was lifted in the context of criminal proceedings, as in the cases of ministers André Bissonnette and John Monroe, who were facing charges in the 1980s. Another example would be uh, the Auditor General of Canada. You know, since 1985, the Auditor General has a, a standing agreement with the government, giving her limited access to cabinet confidences to carry out her mandate. And finally, you know, we've seen uh, cabinet confidentiality being lifted by the government in the context of parliamentary proceedings, as happened uh, during the sponsorship scandal and more recently in the context of the SNC-Lavalin controversy. So uh, there's a, a problem I foresee in this, and SNC was in my mind, and uh, the, current, uh, or the current dispute between the Speaker and the Prime Minister on uh, the Winnipeg lab and the re release of one of those uh, researchers. And, um, and it's the question of, dis of uh, discretion in deciding when to release. So if you keep confidence and secrecy in all the things that might harm you, but if you get a request and it's inconsequential, oh, well, we'll make it available, and, you know, uh, uh, burst the balloon on this. Uh, it seems to me that, that there shouldn't be discretion, that it should be absolute only to protect from the government using it, when, that they'll release things that are advantageous and keep secret things that are disadvantageous. Is that a problem? Well, you know, I would say that the, the most important criterion is the public interest. Does the public interest require disclosure in specific circumstances? Now, outside legal proceedings, it's the government that will make the call. And I suppose, you know, whether the government will agree or not to, to disclose cabinet confidences will, dep will depend, at least in part, on the public pressure that it faces. But in the context of legal proceedings, then, you know, it should be the court who decides whether disclosure is required or not. And uh, so here we're coming to parts where you and I both agree and disagree. Um, the current uh, Section 39 of the uh, Canada Evidence Act says that ministers or uh, the clerk of the Privy Council can pass judgment on whether to release these things or not. And uh, as clerk, I felt an obligation in the public interest to bend over backwards and release as much as was feasible, especially in a uh, court proceeding. And uh, the, the, but the point was, it was discretionary, in my discretion. 
And I felt the burden of that. And therefore, I felt that I exercised it uh, well. Uh, I'm sure I exercised it well. But um, I'm sure that my predecessors and successors have been um, pressured not to. So how, how do you think that um, issue of the absolute protection versus discretion should be played out in the law? Well, you know, I think to, to really grasp the, the important question you're asking, it's important to, to go back and, and explain a little bit how these questions are typically handled by the courts. And, you know, we have Section 39 at the federal level, but uh, historically, these issues of government disclosure were handled under the common law under the doctrine of public interest immunity. So how did and, we get here? How did we get, you know, what was the evolution? Uh, common law is evolutionary. How did we yes. get here? Okay, so the, the basic rule under the common law is that government documents must be protected if disclosing them would injure the public interest. And historically, a key issue under the common law has been who should decide whether disclosure would injure the public interest. Should it be the responsible minister or should it be the judge presiding over the proceedings? Now, during the Second World War, in a case involving the disclosure of the plans of a top secret submarine, the Duncan case, the House of Lords ruled that the minister was the final decision maker. So that meant that if, if the responsible minister objected to the, disclosure, to the disclosure of government documents in litigation, the judge had to accept the objection without inspecting the documents and assessing the public interest. But of course, you know, as can be expected, this rule led to abuses of power. Ministers often objected to disclosure not to protect the public interest, but rather to deprive the other side of crucial evidence in cases against the government. In the Duncan case, the House of Lords had surrendered a core judicial function to the government, namely the power to control the admissibility of evidence in court. And this decision was, was especially troubling because the government often had an interest in the outcome of the proceedings. Fortunately, in 1968, the House of Lords realized the problem and changed its position in the Conway case. And since then, under the common law, judges, not ministers, decide whether government documents should be disclosed in mitigation. And in the book, I argue that this is the only position uh, consistent with the rule of law and the separation of powers. So, Jan, if the common law was so clear and it evolved so gradually, uh, why would Parliament decide to have a statutory absolute immunity for cabinet confidences at the federal level? That, that's a puzzling decision. Uh, we, 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 oh, we no, to... I think it's natural. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a puzzling decision because uh, I should mention that, you know, only in Canada at the federal level do we have a near absolute immunity for cabinet confidences. So it's the only jurisdiction. There is no equivalent provision at the provincial level. There is nothing similar in the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. So why do we have that provision in Canada? Two years after the Conway case was decided in the UK, uh, the Trudeau government decided to enact- Trudeau an pair. Trudeau pair, yes, in 1970, uh, decided to enact an absolute immunity for certain types of information, including uh, national security information and cabinet confidences. And the objective of the relevant provision, uh, which was subsection 41.2 of the Federal Court Act, was to supersede the common law and to give ministers, not judges, the power to decide whether very sensitive information should be disclosed in litigation. Now, by the mid-1970s, many groups within civil society, including the Canadian Bar Association, uh, pressured the Trudeau government to liberalize access to government information. 
without success, unfortunately. It's not until the 1980s that the liberals were finally ready to modernize federal law in that regard. And at the time, they tabled in the House of Commons a bill that would repeal subsection 41.2 and establish an access to information regime. But at the last minute, when the bill was being studied in committee, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau requested an amendment to keep an absolute immunity for cabinet confidences in mitigation and to exclude cabinet documents from the scope of the Access to Information Act. And this amendment resulted in the adoption of Section 39 of the Canada Evidence Act and Section 69 of the Access to Information Act, which, as I mentioned earlier, you know, established the, the strongest immunity for cabinet confidences in any Westminster jurisdiction. Now, Trudeau's decision was paradoxical in the sense that he trusted judges to decide whether every other type of government information should be disclosed, even national, national security information, just not cabinet confidences. Right. I get it, but I, I'm sure most people don't. Um, let's just uh, press this point a bit. Um, is there a fundamental difference in disclosure or the, the legitimacy of, of disclosure or the flip side, the legitimacy of secrecy, if the government is making, if the disclosure is in a civil case between two other parties and the confidences of the cabinet may be interesting and useful in making a judgment, as opposed to the case that you describe where the crown is actually a party to the proceeding, where the crown is being litigated against, uh, when where I found the greatest burden was uh, to lean towards disclosure because we were being sued. Is there a difference in those two cases? Yes, there's a huge difference. Uh, from a rule of law perspective, uh, we require procedural fairness in court proceedings. And procedural fairness implies that the decision maker should be independent and impartial. So if the decision maker with respect to the disclosure of relevant evidence is a party to the litigation, then that individual is not independent and impartial. And we will expect, of course, you know, a self-interested party to suppress evidence that might undermine its case. Yeah, I, I can assure you, I didn't do that, but I, but I, I understand the pressure. So, come back to uh, the conclusion of your book. You have a, a, a very capable uh, description of the uh, nature of the issues, and then suggestions for uh, reform. So, before we get to the reform. Tell us what you think the main problems with the statutory regime of both Section 39 of the Evidence Act and Section 69 of Access to Information Act, which are virtually identical uh, terms. I see uh, two main problems. First, these provisions are too broad. And second, they're not subject to meaningful judicial review. The first problem arises because these provisions don't provide a, a substantive definition of the term cabinet confidences. Instead, they provide a list of documents in which cabinet confidences can be found. But the list is not exhaustive. That means the provision can be used to protect any documents, even emails between public servants that contain information loosely connected to the collective decision-making process. In fact, you know, the statistics on the use of Section 69 show that the vast majority of the documents excluded from the Access to Information Act are not official cabinet documents. Right. So uh, I remember when I was a junior official uh, working on background documents that went to uh, cabinet. They were discussion papers and background documents that would be attached to the actual formal uh, cabinet document. Uh, what's happened to those and, and how, over time, has government changed the way it operates in order to avoid releasing cabinet documents? 
So that's a, that's a very interesting question. Discussion papers uh, were, as you mentioned, a type of kind of document that used to, to initiate a consultation on a given issue. And they presented uh, factual and background information to, to help ministers understand a specific problem and the options available to fix it. And Parliament had incorporated had incorporated an exception for discussion papers in sections 39 and 69. Instead of being protected for 20 years like other cabinet documents, they became accessible once the underlying decision had been made public. Discussion papers were supposed to promote uh, government transparency and to open a window on cabinet proceedings by, by sharing with the broader public the facts that ministers considered in making a decision. But sadly, in 1984, the government stopped producing discussion papers and transferred the factual and background information they contained to the analysis section of Memoranda to Cabinet. Now, this change had the effect of erasing the discussion paper exception because memoranda to cabinet are protected for 20 years. It took nearly two decades before that decision was challenged. In 2003, in the Etel case, uh, the Federal Court of Appeal took note of the government's changes to the cabinet paper system and over uh, the government's objection, ruled that the discussion paper exception remained relevant and should now apply to the analysis section of memoranda to cabinet. But in 2012, uh, the Harper government eliminated the analysis section. And because of it, this change, it's now very, very difficult to apply the discussion paper exception. So this is a, an example of a situation where the government's interpretation and application of sections 39 and 69 was overbroad and abusive, in my view. So, uh, but, but it tells us something about how governments respond to statutory obligations. And, uh, you know, I, when I was clerk, I used to send the prime minister memoranda and he used to respond. And if he agreed with me, he would say agreed or whatever. And if he disagreed, he would say, see me. And he would never write down his uh, views. This is Jean Chrétien. Um, and it, there was a lack of uh, candor and openness in a process that is going to be subject to that openness. There's a lack of openness the more you oblige openness. And what, what we ended up in a, in a position of an oral exchange all the time. And therefore, I think history is poorer as a result. The historical record is lacking. And it would be much better if those kinds of exchanges were kept private so that the, the confidence would be in keeping it secret. So let's just go through a bunch of these different kinds of documents uh, and what you think should be secret or what not. A memorandum to cabinet, that is the proposal of a minister. Agree, that should be uh, confidence. Absolutely, especially the ministerial recommendation. Okay, and the analysis section? Well, my view is that the analysis section, so the section uh, containing only factual and background information should become publicly accessible once the government has made the decision public. Even when it argues for going the other way. It recommended the Saab uh, airplane and they bought the F-35. Well, that, that's the beauty of the analysis section. It does not contain any recommendation. So it's only factual and background information. It does not take a position. Right, but when it assesses the Eurofighter against the F-35, uh, there may be an evident, uh, uh, it may become evident that the government did not take advice. And then it's up to the government to justify its decision to the public. Okay, and uh, what about records of decision of cabinet? Well, records of decisions are meant to identify the consensus reached by minister. So when a cabinet decision is made public, in essence, 
that information is in the public domain. So uh, it, 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 it is puzzling why the record of cabinet decision pertaining to a decision that has been made public should remain confidential. Uh, well, because there may be conditions on it. Um, so we're into a nuanced differ disagreement here. I have a diff difference of view on the analysis section. And what about the minutes of cabinet meetings? That should absolutely remain confidential. You know, this is the heart of what cabinet confidentiality is intended to protect. The minutes would uh, reveal the views and opinions expressed by ministers and potentially disagreements with between ministers, and that so, must remain confidential. And, and this is where you and I totally agree. Uh, I, I do agree on that as well. And the, the real problem is that um, over time, those minutes become anodyne and unhelpful because the note takers, and these are the staff of the Privy Council office, as you once were, um, will sit in a cabinet meeting and say, a minister said, rather than Minister Buggins disagreed uh, or whatever, and that, that becomes unhelpful, frankly. So let, let's turn to your concluded, concluding chapter where you make recommendations. What are the recommendations you make to reform the federal statutory framework? So uh, I put forth you know, many recommendations. The goal of these recommendations is to ensure that the scope of cabinet immunity is proportional to its objective and that cabinet immunity claims are subject to meaningful judicial review. Let me focus on, on four uh, recommendations for the purpose of the discussion. The first is that, in my view, cabinet immunity should be protected based on an injury test, as is the case in the UK and New Zealand, and not a class test, as is currently the case in Canada. So the question uh, should be whether disclosure of the information would be injurious, not whether the information is or is not a cabinet confidence. The second recommendation is that cabinet immunity should not apply when the public interest in disclosure outweighs the public interest in non-disclosure. So even you know, if disclosure might be injurious, sometimes the public interest will require it. For example, you know, to prevent serious health or safety hazards to the public, or to shed light on serious allegations of fraud or mismanagement, as in the case of the sponsorship scandal and uh, the SNC-Lavalin controversy. The third recommendation uh, that I put forth for discussion is that cabinet immunity should not be claimed to protect factual and background information related to a decision that has been made public. In other words, there must be a true and effective exception for discussion papers. And finally, the most important recommendation, and that is related to the point about meaningful judicial review, is that the courts should have the power to inspect cabinet confidences to ensure the government is properly applying section 39 and section 69. In my opinion, this change is the most important. I think we could live to some extent with an overbroad immunity as long as its application is subject to meaningful judicial review. So um, you and I agree on most of that, uh, but let me probe you on your second point. And you're talking about the public interest in disclosure. Uh, what are the criteria to determine the public interest in disclosure? Because you've already talked about the public interest in secrecy. So when we talk about the public interest, it, it, the expression public interest might seem vague, but it means something. In the context of uh, court proceedings, for instance, we, we usually distinguish between two aspects of the public interest. The public interest in the fair administration of justice and the public interest in good government. So when a judge has to inspect you know, government documents and make a call on whether they should be disclosed or if they should be if they should remain public, uh, if they should remain confidential, excuse me, the judge is balancing these two aspects of the public interest. Now, 
How do you assess the public interest in the fair administration of justice? Well, you look at the relevancy of the documents. Do they have probative value? Are they material to a key issue in the litigation? Are they important evidence to ensure the fair disposition of the case? And then you compare that to the interest of good government. Uh, and the interest of good government means that you're looking at uh, the contents of the document to see how sensitive the information is and the extent of the injury that would be caused by their production. And you look also at the timing of disclosure. You know, if you know you were talking about uh, cabinet confidences of a very recent government when the political actors are still active in public life, that's more injurious of, than disclosing uh, confidences that date from 20 years ago. So right. you look at these factors and then you can compare, you know, which is more important. And even then, you know, when the judge makes the call that the documents must be disclosed for the purpose of the litigation, the judge can also minimize the degree of injury by imposing conditions like, you know, only disclosing parts of the good document that is relevant or uh, preparing a summary of the information or getting an admission from the government or imposing a confidentiality undertaking to make sure that the information is used for the purpose of the proceedings, but not otherwise uh, publicly disclosed. So th there are many ways here to, to minimize the degree of injury. Um, uh, okay, then you, you and I agree by and large, and, and I, I would just ask if there's a, this middle ground with conditions, is there an, an analogy with uh, the national security processes at the federal court where they bring in uh, uh, someone who can act for the uh, complainant, but uh, is, does the complainant does not get the uh, actual documents? It would be possible to do that. You know, if the judge feels that he, he or she would be unable to assess the competing aspects of the public interest without having uh, specific representations from uh, the litigant, then the judge could appoint a special counsel who right. would have access to the, to the evidence and could make representations on behalf of the litigant. Good. Okay. Now that you and I agree, Ange, I think we're ready for uh, questions from uh, the, the audience here. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, the first question uh, from an attendee, they say, I view cabinet confidentiality as a rule of the state intended to serve the public interest, not a rule intended to serve the temporary executive officers of the state. The scope and applicability of this rule should be measured in relation to whether this implementation of the rule serves the public interest, not whether it serves the interests of the executive officers, i.e. the government. I'm interested in whether you agree. For example, if the cabinet is advised that an action proposed to it is illegal and no other conflicting advice is given, i.e. the only advice given is that a proposed action is unlawful, how is it not in the public interest that this advice be made known if the action is nonetheless taken? In other words, does the government have a duty to comply with the democratically created law such that its illegal actions are not protected by a rule intended to serve the public interest? Okay, so my short answer is yes. I, I completely agree with the premise of your question. Mm -hmm. Cabinet immunity is a public interest immunity and should only be claimed in the public interest. Now, the issue is, you know, who will decide whether the public interest requires disclosure or not? And the reality is, you know, in the context of legal proceedings, the judge should be the one deciding, but outside the context of legal proceeding, it is the government who will have to uh, weigh the competing aspects of the public interest and make a call. And the remedy against a government that does not make the right call outside the context of uh, legal proceedings is ultimately the ballot box. The, the only thing I'd add to that, I, I agree, is the, um, that the, you know, the black and white case of legal illegal is very rare. 
Uh, and it's seldom that a minister says, I think we should, uh, you know, commit murder or theft or whatever. It's, it's usually this gray area. And therefore, the kind of advice that they get from the public service is not going to be, you know, don't do this. It's going to be, if you do this, here's what the consequences are. And, and then um, uh, Jan's uh, uh, sophisticated judgment about what's in the public interest uh, has to be triggered. Ange, back to you. Uh, yeah, the next uh, question, uh, somebody asks, is there a distinction between public service information and advice given to cabinet and the comments opinions of cabinet members? If the foundation of a cabinet decision to introduce a bill is a report from the public service that is the usual combination of factual reporting and some interpretation of the facts data, do you think this foundation ought to be given to parliament when it is considering this bill? Let me start and you can respond to, Jan will give you the legal answer and I'll just talk about the policy. But it, it strikes me that uh, once again, there, there is an express exception for that is that you don't have to disclose advice to ministers. So the, the actual advice uh, section, the recommendation doesn't have to be disclosed. Uh, whereas uh, the analysis that led you to that may well be disclosed. And the, the problem is, once again, uh, to my mind, and I'm just speaking practically, mm -hmm. is when you write the rationale for this, you build a case. And the case leads inexorably to a recommendation. And it's seldom that you come to a, a case that says, uh, here's all the reasons why you shouldn't do this. We recommend you do this. Uh, you never never see that. So it, it's a, a, the problem is that the recommendation itself and the advice is implicitly embedded in the analysis. I, I completely agree with that. You know, it, it's important to distinguish uh, advice, recommendations, views, and opinions from factual and background information, from analysis. And certainly, you know, the advice part uh, must remain confidential, but all the background information underpinning a government decision that has been made public should also uh, be accessible to further the public debate about the decision. So we've seen that, you know, uh, when there was more than 10 years ago, a debate in the House of Commons about uh, the cost of the F-35 fighter jets the Harper government wanted to buy these jets and the House of Commons wanted to know exactly how much it would cost. And the government refused to disclose the information on the basis that the information was recorded in a cabinet document. Well, that makes absolutely no sense. You know, when you're asking, when, when the House of Commons is asking for financial information about the cost of a, a decision that has been made public, you, you cannot use cabinet confidentiality to refuse the disclosure of the information. Yep, Ange? Uh, yeah, uh, the next question. Uh, do you think the ATI uh, a section 69 exclusion for cabinet records should be changed into an exemption and why? Yes, I absolutely believe that it should be an exemption. Um, and the key, the key answer here is, you know, it needs to be an, ex an exemption because we need to have uh, meaningful oversight and review of government decisions to exclude cabinet documents. So oversight by the information commissioner and then uh, judicial review by the federal court. And to have meaningful oversight and review, the information commissioner and the federal court need to be able to inspect the relevant documents to make sure that Section 69, the cabinet immunity uh, exemption or exclusion, as is currently the case, is properly applied. I agree. And next question. Uh, the next question, uh, what should be the time limit for cabinet records released uh, via the ATIA? 15 years, 10, 5? Infinity. <laughs> no, I, um, I, I, I th this is where I would use the uh, 
judgment that Yan's whole framework is built on, that some information should be made available, uh, I would say immediately, the background information that doesn't exist anymore, the discussion papers, and um, that some of it should be protected for 20 years. But as you said, that the, if you're going to shift to a harm test, then you've got to exercise judgment on the extent of the harm versus the public interest in disclosure, the public interest in secrecy. So. Absolutely. And I, I would add to that that any number of years is uh, arbitrary. You know, under some statutes, uh, it's 10 years, other have 15 years. At the federal level, we have 20 years. Other statutes have 25 years. So how do you decide for how long uh, cabinet documents should be protected? Well, I think you know a useful criterion, a more objective criterion, would be to look at the expected duration of a minister's career. So we could collect you know, empirical data to, to see you know, how long do we expect a minister to be in public life? And perhaps that number would be useful in, in choosing a, a number of years. Now, obviously, there will be outliers. You know, some people will be in the public, uh, in the service of the public for longer than others. And you mentioned Joe Clark and Jean Chrétien, but uh, it could be useful to have you know, a more precise idea of, of how long do we expect ministers to be uh, in, in the public life, because ultimately, you know, the goal behind uh, this cabinet immunity is to make sure that whatever they say in private won't come back to, to bite them while they're still active in politics. Well, and who would have thought Jean Charest would run for the leadership? Well, uh, it turns out public life lasts a long time, especially if you're a minister when you're 38. Um, so, Ange, next question. Uh, yeah, the next question. Uh, in the FOI law of the United Kingdom, Canada's parliamentary model, there is a harms test for cabinet records in section 36, which is uh, information to which this section applies as exempt information if, in the reasonable opinion of a qualified person, disclosure of the information under this act would or would likely to prejudice the maintenance of the convention of the collective responsibility. Should Canada's ATI a section 69 have the same harms test? In my opinion, yes. And that's one of my recommendations that we move from uh, the current class test, whether a document contains cabinet confidences or not, to an injury test, and that we ask whether disclosure of the documents would injure uh, the candor of cabinet discussions, the efficiency of the collective decision-making process or uh, the solidarity of uh, ministers. So the convention of collective responsibility. And the only thing I'd add is the who matters in this. It's not just, I mean, the notion, I agree with uh, Jan, the, the, the notion of making a judgment of the injury is important, but uh, whose measure of, of injury is, is very important. In the case of the uh, Winnipeg lab and the current uh, dispute between the speaker and the prime minister, um, the speaker's offer uh, of who would make the judgment on this was the clerk of the House of Commons. The clerk of the House of Commons, a very, I'm sure, respected individual, has never seen a secret document in his life. The Speaker of the House of Commons has never seen a top secret document, let alone a code word document. The top secret kind of discussions that comes from uh, our allies, he's in no position to make a judgment about whether that document should be released or not. So the who matters. I agree with Yan that if we believe in the rule of law, ultimately the court should be uh, a judge, should be in a position, uh, given the, the possibility of saying, this is to be released. But in the current dispute on the Winnipeg lab, I think it's ludicrous to think that somebody like the clerk of the house, who's very, very knowledgeable about procedure, would be able to make a national security judgment. Sorry, yes. And, I, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, I, I agree with what you say, Mel. Uh, the, the only point that I wanted to add is, 
know, if we go back to the uh, the crisis about the disclosure of the Afghan detainees documents uh, during the Harper uh, government's uh, time in office, you know, th there was a similar uh, dispute between the government and the House of Commons. And ultimately, you know, the political parties, with the exception of the NDP, got together and reached an agreement, right. an agreement pursuant to which, you know, a, an ad hoc committee of MPs would uh, review all the documents and decide on disclosure with the exception of cabinet confidences or uh, solicitor client privilege for, for these uh, two types of information which were considered especially sensitive and not the kind of information you want to share with your political opponents, uh, the agreement was that uh, we would have a, pan a panel of arbiters, so essentially former uh, Supreme Court judges, look at the information and make the call. Ultimately, uh, the Harper government was defeated before this process could, could take place, but in principle, I think it's a good idea. And, and I agree with that. And the, remember that um, on occasion, we have sworn in leaders of opposition parties as privy councillors because they take the oath that I described at the beginning, which is that they, will, they swear to keep secret and a confidence the material that they see. An example of this is the, par, uh, the uh, national and and NSI COP, uh, the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians. It is not a parliamentary committee. It is a committee of parliamentarians, but they've all been given that oath to swear. And therefore, they are within the executive in the sense that they have access to all those secrets, including cabinet confidences. Ange, next question. Uh, yeah, the next question, um, somebody asked, are policy recommendations uh, and analysis made to cabinet also protected by cabinet confidence, or is it only the minister's debate during the meetings of whether to implement the policy recommendations or not? Yeah. Well, you know, the way the policy recommendations are presented to ministers is always through a minister. So it will be minister A will make a presentation to the other ministers saying, you know, here's the problem and here's my recommendation on how to solve it. So in that sense, yes. But, you know, all the preliminary work done by public servants to get to that position is not a cabinet confidences. Uh, only, you know, when the minister is formulating a, a recommendation to his colleagues, do we get into the realm of cabinet confidentiality. And, and therefore, drafts don't exist. <laughs> and next question. Uh, yeah, the next one, uh, uh, Victor says, I have no disagreement with the general concept of cabinet secrecy, but the problem in Canada is with secrecy and the policy development process and related research processes. The lack of access to background papers, assessments of opinions. Access to information is lengthy, costly, and obscure. Departmental archiving of older materials is haphazard and also subject to access rules. What would you do to open up government so that information is shared in a timely manner? I'll, I'll, I'll offer a quick comment to that. Um, uh, and first of all, resent Victor asking it. Um, I, uh, I think that uh, it's important to um, make sure that that material is protected for the purpose of the historical record. And so one of the things that we haven't talked about yet is the National Archives or Library and Archives Canada. Uh, and that's the custodian of all of these secret documents until they get released and even after they've been released. Uh, and they play a very important role in this. And you wanna be able to uh, ensure that all that background material, the, the econometric regressions, the draft documents, the, the, the memorandum from a junior economist to the director, uh, that all that stuff gets preserved, uh, not as a cabinet confidence, because it isn't. It's background analytic work. But you want that preserved and you want it available to the public. And uh, I think that that all uh, is important. But uh, as the, one of the conditions for making that public and keeping that preserved is that you keep secret the material that's ministerial. 
That's a very good point. Uh, on the broader issue, you know, I think that the Access to Information Act that, that we have right now is old. You know, it was drafted in the 1980s. Uh, before the internet, before emails, before social media. So yes, of course, it needs to be modernized. It needs to be updated. Uh, but the most important change from my perspective is uh, the change in culture. You know, a move from a culture of secrecy to a culture of openness. You know, to change the onus, you know, to start from the principle that we give the information unless there's a valid reason to keep the information confidential, rather than uh, for a public servant uh, when he or she receives an access to information request to go through the list of possible exemptions and try to identify all the exemptions that could be applied to a specific document and to refuse disclosure. So that's a, a mechanical process, and it's often how uh, access requests are handled currently, but to start from a principle of openness and then re really focus on uh, the injury test. You know, would disclosure of this information be injurious or not? And if the answer is no, then it should be released. And, and that's why I would draw a uh, build a fence around the real secrets that you need to keep and make it very high, a very high fence, but everything else, make it all public. And next question. Uh, yeah, the next one is from Dean. Uh, Dean asks, how is it that other jurisdictions operate effectively without an absolute protection of cabinet confidences, yet Canada needs this protection? Well, I'll, I'll leave that one to you, yeah. <laughs> yes, my, my, my answer is very short. I, I don't believe that we need an absolute protection for cabinet confidences, period. You know, I think that the statutory framework that we have right now goes beyond what is necessary for the proper functioning of responsible government. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. I, might, I think we would draw the line in a slightly different place, but uh, the principle you enunciate, I think is correct. Ange? Uh, yeah, uh, next question uh, is from Stanley. Uh, in New Zealand, the Official Information Act 1982 does not contain any blanket exemptions for cabinet confidences. Ministers are also encouraged to proactively release cabinet material, which is most often published on the internet. In practice, it is common for cabinet documents and advice to be released. As a previous secretary of the cabinet said, virtually all written work in the government these days is prepared on the assumption that it will be made public in time. Should Canada change to the New Zealand FOI model? I, I, the only thing I would uh, say as a former cabinet secretary is if you do that, uh, you're basically saying that documents are going to be written with the Globe and Mail in mind. I completely agree with uh, your assessment, Mel. You know, if you if if disclosure is mandatory, then the documents will be drafted differently. They will be drafted for public consumption. Right. And. Um, yeah, the next one, somebody says, I agree that there is a need for some secrecy with the case of the mandate letters, they are statements of the government's priorities. And while I can see that the discussion and the prioritization leading up to the determination of the priorities can remain as confidences as they benefit from the candor and opinion of the ministers, but the priorities of government should be public. What is Yan's view on this? Well, thank you very much for this question. So uh, the question of mandate letters is, uh, is a bit controversial right now. Uh, I would start by saying that in essence, you know, mandate letters contain cabinet confidences in the sense that they are a, a, a communication between the prime minister and a minister in which the prime minister will identify uh, the government's priorities, the minister's priorities and will typically give advice, guidance, and instructions to the ministers. And obviously, you know, the various priorities identified in uh, these letters will eventually be subject to the cabinet decision-making process. So in essence, uh, mandate letters contain cabinet confidences. Now, obviously, you know, the prime minister can make a decision to disclose them publicly, 
it is within his or her prerogative. But I don't think that we should force prime ministers to disclose mandate letters. Because if we do that, uh, it may have unintended consequences. The outcome may be that the prime minister will stop drafting mandate letters. Or if they decide to keep drafting mandate letters, they will be drafted differently. They will be drafted for public consumption and won't contain the kind of personal advice that we would typically expect to find in mandate letters. So I think we have to be careful here. Uh, you know, uh, forcing the disclosure of mandate letters won't necessarily lead to greater transparency in the sense that uh, some information will be lost. You know, the kind of personal advice that the prime minister will want to give to a minister will be communicated orally or by other means and won't be recorded in the letter and won't be available for uh, the historical archives. So something will be lost in the process. And next question. Uh, yeah, next question. Uh, somebody says, as a follow up to the analysis and background question, uh, I'd like to hear from both of you as to the public interest uh, in Parliament, for example, the public interest in having its representatives have all the info they need to consider whether to adopt a pr proposed law or not. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that is essential. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, one of the great institutions of uh, Parliament that uh, are one of the great institutions of Canada that really doesn't get very much uh, um, attention or uh, credit is the Library of Parliament. And that is uh, essentially a group of analysts that serve parliamentarians. And so backbenchers can pose questions and get briefings and uh, they serve the committees uh, of parliament. Uh, and I've got to say they do a, a brilliant, or in my time when I was in government, they did a brilliant job. Uh, and so, and the public service owes a duty of care to members of parliament. And so questions that come from parliamentarians, whenever I was testifying before a parliamentary committee, I felt the obligation of being open and candid uh, and providing them with simple answers to their tough questions. Uh, and the background material that anytime they would ask for, well, by and large, they would get uh, from government, um, unless it was advice and things like that, that was kept uh, private. So I, but I think there's an important duty that the public service of Canada has towards members of parliament. And that starts to get undermined when you create more and more agents of parliament. So um, when the parliamentary budget officer starts to second guess the Department of Finance, the Department of Finance becomes an adversary against the, uh, the parliamentary budget office, uh, rather than feeling an obligation and a duty to parliamentarians as the Department of Finance should feel. That is, the accountability should be clear. They are accountable to parliament through a minister. So they, you know, the, no official has a duty to disclose anything to a parliamentarian, but they owe a duty to parliament through the minister. And that's to be preserved when you set up a tension between the PBO and the Department of Finance, then I think that's actually unhealthy. I, I agree with that. And I would simply add, you know, your, your question highlights the importance of discussion papers, of the factual and background information underpinning cabinet decisions, and the importance that this information uh, be publicly released once cabinet has made the underlying initiative public. I, and I agree with that, but, but in, in parliaments, deliberate, oh, you're saying that once they table the legislation, Parliament um, should see the background documents. Everybody should see it, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable, but okay. But, and, but that's, that's the essence of the discussion paper exception. Yes. That's, that's the essence of the exception that was inserted in section 39 and 69. In yeah. That was the intention. 
And un unfortunately, that, that intention has not been fulfilled. Quite so. Um, Ange? Uh, yeah, the next question, somebody asks, uh, why can't everything be recorded and be trusted not to be revealed until 20 years in the future or so? It should be. Um, the, the evidence is not on your side, unfortunately. Uh, so there are leaks. And one of the problems is that often leaks are intentional. So the government makes a decision that, you know, they want to prepare the public for a difficult conversation and they'll leak stuff. Um, I can't imagine that, but imagine. Uh, so you need to be uh, discerning in this. And then there are people who are méchants, who want to get in the way of a, a decision. And you really have to, uh, I mean, you've sworn a duty to keep things secret. You have to respect the obligation, I think. And the, the only thing I would add to that is that, you know, if you are recorded uh, as a minister, you'll be more careful about what you do. And if the conversation is recorded and you know that at some point in time, people will be able to listen to the exact conversation and your exact words, well, you'll be very careful about how you express yourself. And we might lose uh, the candor of the discussion. So it might have a chilling effect on the ability of ministers to speak freely. Agree, and? Uh, yeah, the next question, uh, somebody says, your answer that the factual information and analysis upon which advice to cabinet, cabinet is based should not be subject to confidentiality. Would this factual information and analysis information be available to the Auditor General? Exactly. So under the agreement uh, between the Auditor General and the government, which uh, has been entrenched in many orders in council since 1985, the Auditor General has access to all the factual and background information underpinning cabinet decisions. And? Uh, yeah, uh, the next one from Stan again. Uh, Scotland's FOI law expresses similar concepts on cabinet solidarity, but contains a stronger harms test than the UK one. Uh, section 30, information is exempt. Uh, information if it's disclosure under the act this act a would or would likely to would be likely to prejudice substantially the maintenance of the convention of the collective responsibility of the scottish ministers b would or would like be likely to inhibit substantially the free and frank provision of advice or the free and frank exchange of views for the purposes of deliberation or c would otherwise prejudice substantially or be likely to prejudice substantially the effective conduct of public affairs should Canada follow the model of the Scotland FOI law? Yeah, I, I, I'll just offer a comment, but I'll defer to uh, prof the professor of law. Uh, the, the, um, it strikes me that it is helpful to have those three um, uh, sub clauses, which give you an indication of what parliament has in mind or the legislature has in mind uh, of what is the public interest, so that the, whoever's making that judgment has some guidance, and that's helpful. But this comes back to that optimal, uh, optimal degree of discretion, because you, you know, they're still pretty vague, and they leave a lot of discretion uh, for the uh, decision maker, which I think is appropriate. But absolutely, I think discretion is unavoidable. Uh, but that model, the Scottish model, is, is great because the focus is on the injury and the injury to what? To the proper functioning of responsible government by identifying specifically you know, the candor argument, the efficiency argument, and the solidarity argument. So I think it's a, it's a neat model. Okay, and? Uh, yeah, the next question uh, from Justin, I think Ian has failed to acknowledge Mel's point that analysis is not neutral, but is often structured to support the recommendation. So is it really so simple to say that the recommendation should be secret, but the analysis public? Does release of the analysis effectively reveal the recommendation? If so, what should be done? Well, you know, it, it, you need to take that into account when you uh, write cabinet documents. If you know that you're going to have a discussion paper that's intended to initiate a, a debate uh, 
a, a consultation on a given issue, you write the discussion paper in a way that it won't contain uh, recommendation in a way that, that will be balanced. Uh, obviously, you know, when you start uh, mixing analysis with recommendation, then it's something different. And if, if it's not possible to uh, separate the recommendation part from uh, the objective analysis part, then it's not really a discussion paper because it contains a recommendation. So my point is, you know, cabinet documents have to be drafted with this in mind. If you're drafting a discussion paper, it should be objective and neutral and not contain any sorts of recommendation. And I think the uh, cabinet manual uh, that public service that, that gives guidance to public servants on how to write cabinet documents would uh, make the distinction that you uh, and the problem is that there there should be a bright line and the line is a little bit fuzzy. Ange, we have uh, time for another question or two. Uh, yeah, the next question, uh, should the exemption for Section 659 cabinet records be mandatory or discretionary? And should there be a public interest override for cabinet records? So in my view, it should be discretionary and discretionary because, you know, as soon as you have an injury test and as soon as you take into account the public interest, then it cannot be mandatory. Um, so mandatory is good for a class test. You know, when you say uh, public officials have to refuse disclosure of the following types of documents, but if you adopt an injury criterion, then there's an element of discretion. And if you adopt a public interest override on top of that, then obviously uh, there's a discretionary element there to, to weigh and balance the competing aspects of the public interest. Um, Jim, do we have uh, time for one more question? Yes, yes, we do. Okay, and? Okay, uh, the next question, uh, somebody says, uh, somebody asks, uh, candor is lost not by mandating the publication of the mandate letters, but in the, pub in the publication of them per se. Do you assume that the current prime minister maintains off the record mandate letters or real mandate letters to the confidentiality guide ministers to the to confidentiality guide ministers on how to approach the published mandates? So I, I, I have no idea what the right answer to that is. I have, I, if I knew the answer, I would uh, not tell you. Uh, but since I don't know the answer, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, my, uh, my impression is, uh, and I almost said this earlier in response to a question uh, that was posed to Yan, that there are mandate letters that are made public and for public consumption. And if there isn't now, there will develop a direction letter that is the prime minister saying, I've just, you know, we, we've all agreed because we ran on this platform and I gave you the mandate letter, which are those elements of the platform that are in your area of responsibility. But here's what I really want you to do. And it'll either be as Jan suggested oral, or I think more likely it will be on the record and it will be in something that will be not called a mandate letter <laughs> and, uh, and it will be unhelpful. Uh, so I, when, when Prime Minister Trudeau uh, started, well, actually it was Premier Wynne started um, publishing the mandate letters, it, um, it sort of undermined their credibility and legitimacy. And it's in that sense that I think they're unhelpful, that public, and I agree that the question was put, uh, the, it's the publication per se that is the problem. So I agree. I, I fully agree with that too. Jim, I think we've, um, we've answered most of the questions. Yes, you have. Uh, and you've answered them very uh, well. Uh, this has been a rich, rich discussion. It's been a, a pleasure. And I want to thank the audience. And I want to thank you. Uh, clearly, the audience was so stimulated by what you had to say that we had this raft of questions, uh, which was very helpful. So it was a it was a, a wonderful marriage here of presenters and audience uh, to make it a truly informative event. So I want to thank uh, you, Mel, and you, Jan. Uh, I want to encourage people to buy your book and read it. Um, 
and uh, I want to thank the audience for for your participation in, in this discussion. Uh, a video of this uh, conversation will be posted on the Center for Free Expression website tomorrow. And uh, I'd encourage all of you who participated in the audience to share uh, the link for that uh, with anybody in your network who you think may be interested in it. We're also going to be having a short um, debriefing with uh, Mel and Jan after this event. Uh, I forgot to tell the two of them that Ange will be sending them an email during the event uh, uh, where we can go. And at that, I'm going to ask them for some suggestions of readings or other resources on this topic that we will post along with the video so that uh, if you do want to read more about this, uh, there will be some suggestions for you that will be posted there. I'd also like to say that our next event will be the second in, in the Center for Free Expression series on threats to press freedom. Uh, we're, we're looking initially at threats internationally. And the first uh, event in that series was looking at the media law in India as it has been applied in Kashmir. And we had a panel of Kashmiri journalists. Uh, the next event, which is going to be uh, two weeks from today on Wednesday, April 6th, I'm sorry, one week from today, <laughs> It's later than March that I thought. Uh, next week, uh, same time, same day, Wednesday, uh, April 6th at 4 p.m. It's going to focus on what's happened in Afghanistan. Uh, it's going to be Afghanistan, the war against journalists. And we're going to have some quite eminent uh, Afghani journalists, most of whom are in exile, uh, including Shagofa Siddiqui, who is an Afghan journalist and was director of ZAN TV, which ZAN is the Parsi, uh, uh, Farsi and uh, a Persian term for women. The Women's TV Network in, in Afghanistan will be one of the panelists. Uh, and one of the remarkable things during the Afghan war uh, the 20 year war was the emergence and opportunity for women to participate in journalism and the role they played uh, and how that was brought to an end with the uh, in, two th in 2021 with the uh, reemergence re of the Taliban being in control. But it's going to be a really rich and interesting discussion about the changes and the challenges faced in Afghanistan during the war, when in fact it was the government and the U.S. authorities who are going after the journalists, and now it's the Taliban in a far more zealous and horrible way. Um, so if you're interested in that, I'd encourage you to listen. The details are on the Center for Free Expression website, cfe.ryerson.ca. Uh, Till then, I want to thank all of you again and look forward to seeing you in future. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.